like to go for walks on rainy, gray, muddy days. A weather deemed by many as imperfect, but not by me. Because if nature in its vastness can be imperfect, then I have every right to be, to be imperfect. As runners pass by me, I think at least twice, I walked even slower. As I walked, I felt like the asymmetrical trees bent a bit lower to greet me, to acknowledge me. Runners, on the other hand, didn't notice it. So offended trees erected themselves even taller in arrogance of not being recognized. This type of processing is not an uncommon experience for me. I am a sensitive person. And what a self-actualization moment it was when I realized that. I was preparing for a seminar for mental health professionals when I realized that. I found this article that I just couldn't put down. It talked about this gene that's related to something they called sensory processing sensitivity. So I dug as deep as I could, and let me confess, there's no better journey. There's no journey that's as difficult, as painful, but as rewarding and as sweet as the journey to self-discover. The term highly sensitive person, or sometimes called sensory processing sensitivity, was coined by Dr. Elaine Aaron. And as it turns out, about 20% of us are highly sensitive. So this trait, kind of to summarize, it describes someone who has a very um, complex inner life. And as it turns out, it's also an innate biological trait. Although I believe that certain childhoods can exacerbate genetic tendencies towards this trait or even initiate the trait. In fact, the brains of sensitive people is wired a little bit differently. So when we put them in the scanner, and uh, researchers would give them photos of landscapes and say, you know what, we want you just to tell us if you notice any changes in the scenes. And guess what? In the brains of sensitive people, their visual areas, their attentional centers in the brain are more activated than in people with low sensitivity. I was trying to come up with a good way to paint a picture of a highly sensitive person. But I didn't want to come with a checklist or a shopping list of what, you know, the different tendencies. So what I did instead is I took the average of the stories of many sensitive people and I put it concisely in one um, short scenario. Here it goes. Jenna likes to throw herself in the arms of nature. She experiences the blueness of the sea like nobody else. As she walks, she feels the trees bend just a little to whisper in her ears. Mountains provide a sense of greatness, like there's something out there that's much bigger. As she enters a room, she's the first to notice if there's any subtle changes in the room, any odors, any noise, which means she also startles easily. If she watches a movie or a, a drama series or reads a book, she finds bits and pieces of herself in each of the characters. Needless to say, when she watches a violent movie or, an involved, or reads an involved book, she, it takes her many weeks to recalibrate her sense of self. At work, she's an amazing worker, but if she's being observed by her manager, she delivers the worst performance. She's very conscientious because she doesn't want to make mistakes, which makes her very guarded in new novel situations and creates some anxiety because she does not, she knows she can't handle negative feedback very well. Now, highly sensitive people come in all different shapes and colors. So you need not to match the story exactly to classify yourself as a highly sensitive person. Now, um, high, high sensitivity or a highly sensitive person is not necessarily synonymous with 
being shy or being an introvert. Actually, in fact, 30% of highly sensitive people happen to be extroverts. So um, it is certain that being insensitive is something that's not desirable by society. But does that mean that the opposite, being sensitive, is appreciated by society? As it turns out, our society can't make up its mind. It considers both to be bad. So if you are insensitive, it wants you to be more considerate. If you're sensitive, it wants you to grow thicker skin. In other words, we're never going to be comfortable in any personality type. <laughs> now, funny it is, but this mismatch between societal demands and our everyday kind of very busy lives and the kind of life that we live nowadays and this personality type can give rise to things like depression and anxiety and other psychological problems. Because of the elaborate processing and the deep processing, then things like negative feedback won't go unnoticed. And there'll be analysis over analysis and all kind of mental gymnastics on that. Which means also that at work, when there is stressful times, because the nervous system is so excitable in highly sensitive people, that translates into being at a higher risk of burnout at work. Now, this relationship between high sensitivity and psychological difficulties is only found in people who have had a troubled childhood. In fact, the opposite is true for people who had an okay or a decent childhood. In other words, this trait is associated with all kinds of positive qualities. It's not surprising that you find this trait predominant in people like poets, writers, painters, musicians. And in recent brain studies, they found that the brain areas that support this trait overlap quite a bit with areas that support empathy. And since we're on the brain, let's mention one more. One brain area called the insula is hyperactive in people who are sensitive. Well, what does the insula do? The insula is responsible for processing inner sensations. So it's not surprising that in highly sensitive people, they're very attuned to the inner world, which means also that they're going to be very sensitive to things like pain, hunger, and caffeine. So I understand that in our overwhelming society, that this might rust your golden trait to be sensitive. How do we shine it again? How do you make the best out of your sensitivity? Here is one basic, simple principle to keep in mind. This is an advantage. As long as that this increased sensitivity and the benefits of it outweighs the biological cost of a complicated, complex neural system, hyperactive nervous system, hyper-aroused brain areas, which all translates to a higher metabolic demand. Okay, so that wasn't so simple. Let's translate that into more doable, concrete things. Because you have a highly excitable nervous system, you want to reduce arousal in your environment, so limit the number of intense stimuli. You want to avoid sensory overload. If your job or your life requires that you multitask, you need to limit the number of tasks that you're doing at the same time. And I highly encourage that if you do so social media, nothing wrong with that, but you want to limit the number of social media outlets that you're involved with. Regularly force quit your nervous system. Breathing exercises, meditation, quiet time. But if quiet time means that you're gonna have a diarrhea of negative thoughts, don't do it, then you want to fail to cancel this noise with other types of noise. If you're into it, prayers can work. So I like to do this prayer called Zik, which involves the repetition of scripted statements of gratitude that's repeated a certain set of time. If you find that you're having too many thoughts, that it's clouding your judgment, slowing your cognitive abilities, Put them down on paper. Take them out of your mind and on paper. You never know. Something beautiful, awesome, 
therapeutic might come out of it. Remember, you are a highly creative person. So draw, color, write, whatever your talent is. Lastly, be comfortable in your own skin. Be comfortable in your own genetics. Be comfortable in your own predisposition. Own it. Never be ashamed of it. And remember that this is related to giftedness and creativity and all of these wonderful things. Don't be shy about talking about your soft skills as you discuss this in long-term relationships. Use the soft skills to be the best person that you could be, the best parent, the best child, the best sibling, the best manager, the best spouse. The last thing I want to confess or admit, I think, is that when my soul yarn unraveled, an era of confusion ensued. And finally, when I got to my core, an anxiety over not knowing made it worse. And it didn't subside until I was able to name it, I was able to describe it, I was able to talk about it. And I learned that there's others out there that are the same. Now that I confidently know that, now I can come and rewrap elements of my life in a way that makes me comfortable, in a way that makes me shine, in a way that makes me better. And most importantly, in a way that does not choke my core. I invite all of you today to take this daunting journey, although very rewarding, starting today. Will you? I hope so. Good luck. Thank you.